back. Uh, I'm Marsha Weiss, very happy to have you with us for our Textile Design Symposium. It is my pleasure to welcome Todd Bowles. Okay, well, thank you. Good morning, everybody. Um, Todd Bowles here, nice to see all of you. Um, there, how's that? Perfect. <laughs> Good morning, everybody. Todd Bowles here. Welcome. Good to see everybody. Um, I am Todd Bowles. I am a graduate of a NC State School of Textiles, and I started my career in 1990-something <laughs> um, and have been a textile designer and worked in the textile industry since 1994. And I have loved it. I've had a really, really wonderful career and I'm so pleased and honored that you all would ask me to be here this morning. And I'm looking forward to sharing a, sh a few um, thoughts and, and, and things with you this morning. Um, I would like to share with you uh, a little briefing that I have uh, come up with. And uh, I, I would be happy to uh, share it with all of you. Um, so I wanted to share with you guys a few things that I've put together that have Really, you know, it's funny how, and when you're in the flow of things, you're just going from day to day to day, and you don't always realize, you know, wow, I'm really learning. I'm really, you know, capturing a lot of information here. And I was asked to speak a few years ago, and I put this briefing together, and I want to share it with you all. Um, it's just little things that have helped me and have really uh, proved useful in my career. And if you'll look uh, at the very top here, uh, welcome to the Todd Bowles uh, School of uh, Textile Design. The thing I want to leave with all of the students this morning, whether you're in textile design or you're going into sales or some other aspect of textiles, it's so important, I think, in your career to be very clear on your intention. And that's something I'd heard, oh, I don't know, about 10 or 15 years ago. And I thought, well, what is intention? And intention is what it is that you want to have happen in the end. So if you're clear on your intention, your, as you utter those thoughts, as you say those things, those words then begin to resonate in your cerebral cortex. And when you know what it is that you want to have happen in the end, all of your actions flow towards that intention. So for example, if your intention is to make a really beautiful textile that is sellable and come as a great value and has a great price attached to it, then everything that you do from the drawing that you make to the yarns that you use, you will, your, all of your actions will, will dovetail with your intention. So with that being said, if you're, I think when you set your intention, so often in the past when I have hosted um, college students or interns, uh, I don't think sometimes they're always clear about their intention. You'll, you'll give them a project and they'll say, oh, I'm going to make, you know, unicorns with rainbows and fireflies. And, you know, and you're thinking, well, you know, what is your intention? If you're, in other words, you can't just build uh, an idea or concept without having an idea of what it is that you want to have happen in the end. So with that being said, your intention design, to, to design beautiful, functional product that sells well. Whenever you're getting confused, whenever you don't know what you're going to do next, go back to that. That's always what should be at the, at the forefront of whatever it is that you're doing. How do you, how do you do that? How do you go about doing that? Well, first of all, you need to know what's out there already. You need to take a look when you go to work somewhere, look at, ask questions, find out what are the top sellers? What are the things that this company has always built their, uh, their business on? What are those looks? What are things that have been successful? How are, why are they successful? What are the price points? Who are their customers? Find out also what your competition is doing. You don't want to copy what they're doing. You don't want to be too familiar with what they're doing, but you want to make sure that you're doing something that's a little bit different and hopefully a little bit better. Um, as you are in textiles and textile design, very often you'll come up with a concept or a project and your boss or the company you're working for, they won't necessarily like that idea or that concept. So, um, you know, 
I would say to you, please don't be defensive. If you're going to be in any kind of design related career, you are going to receive critiques. You are going to be told from time to time, that's not a good idea or that's not going to work. The sooner you learn to embrace that and not take that in a defensive manner, the better off you will be. Secondly, your intention should also be that you're thinking in a broader scale. So uh, down here in Roman numeral two, point number two, on a large or more comprehensive long-term scale, you wanna grow, evolve, and improve as a design professional. So you want to constantly evolve, constantly learn new skills, constantly be better and think about bettering yourself. If you are just doing the same thing and doing the same kinds of designs over and over and over, chances are you're gonna get stale. Every designer has what I call a voice. Your design voice may be uh, playful. It may be really masculine. It may be really feminine. It may be really um, colorful. But whatever your design voice is, you always want to know what your design voice is and try to refine it. And one of the best ways to do that is to receive critiques and receive them as uh, blessings and not as, uh, uh, you know, that you're being attacked or criticized in a negative way. So, be open. Um, if you receive a fair critique, embrace it. Um, another great idea, if you are work, find a mentor, hopefully in the company that you work for. Find a, a person who your, your personalities dovetail, there's good chemistry, uh, you like each other, and hopefully this person has a lot of experience and they're really willing to kind of put their arm around you and show you the ropes. Uh, if you can find someone like that, you know, um, that's great. Partner with them, tell them. I want you to mentor me, <laughs> teach me, tell me, I want to learn from you. And, um, you know, old veterans like me, we love that. We love to, you know, think that, you know, we're sort of in some way short circuiting the suffering <laughs> that we, that we had to learn from the school of hard knocks and maybe hopefully um, help a young person learn faster and accelerate that learning curve. Um, you know, people say all the time in design, where do you get your ideas? Where do you get your inspiration from? the way you get your ideas and your inspiration is by just being open. You know, you are basically like a giant satellite dish and you are just constantly taking in information. So, you know, you want to read, you want to look obviously uh, uh, um, Pinterest, online, social media, TV, uh, you know, magazines, whatever, whatever speaks to you, whatever resource speaks to you, be open take that information in. I'm someone who, I like things that are very visual. So I'm a big believer in magazines because I like to rip things out and post them on the wall. Obviously I'm very old school, but I do. I like a bulletin board. I use T pens and I just, everything that turns me on that I think looks good, that speaks to my design voice. I may use it. I may not. I just pin it on the wall. Some people journal, some people put um, their ideas uh, in, um, a notebook, whatever works for you, but you need to keep track of your visual and your creative data that's coming to you. Uh, it's If you don't ever record it or document it or put it on the wall, you kind of, what you don't see, you forget about. So it's very important to sort of, to keep, uh, keep track of those ideas and those things. Okay, so now let's get to the good stuff. After we've set our intention on a short-term basis, which is to grow and which is to design beautiful sellable product. And we've covered our long-term basis, which is to grow and improve, not just as a designer, but as a professional and as a human being, we wanna put it together. Okay, so um, I often find that putting it together is really just all about being non-resistant. Now, what does that mean? Have you ever been in like a swimming pool and you push your hands through the water and the water does not resist. The water just allows your hands to flow through. And you want to be, you want, you want, you want your career, you want your life, you want the design process to be like that. You want to just be easy and let things happen. If you're trying too hard and you try to make it work, sometimes it doesn't work as well. So 
be non-resistant, take it in, don't resist it and never say never. So just be open to whatever needs to happen. As I said earlier, some of the ways that you want to put it together is you want, A, you, you need to start out at the genesis, you need to collect those ideas. I'm a big believer in vision boards, bulletin boards, uh, tear sheets, printouts, whatever. Uh, your, I, have, I keep a design notebook and I just keep it in my bag and I doodle in it. I write notes in it, whatever I feel, I, I staple uh, clippings uh, of, from magazines to it. And I'm just constantly keeping ideas. <clears throat> this is super important. When you are designing product, think about your audience. Imagine that you are walking into the store and you are seeing your product made up on a sofa or on a chair or on a, an accent pillow. What store is that? Who's going to buy this? Working backwards from that end, if you work backwards from that end, you kind of say, okay, well, I need to start from, from, the, from scratch. So if I'm going to do something that looks very Ralph Lauren, that's very uh, gender neutral, I'm gonna do something that has jewel tones. And I know this company, their, their magic price point is between $5.95 and $8.95. I'm gonna need to use these yarns. I'm gonna need to sort of start looking for ideas that dovetail with masculine library nautical looks, you're just constantly working back to that original intention of Ralph Lauren looks. Um, know your audience, know their color taste and their price points. So it'll be very important for you to uh, find out, you know, when you go to work somewhere, what is, who is the audience? Who is the buyer? You know your competition. What do they like? What do they normally buy? What do they, what do they gravitate towards? Work with the other designers, work with your creative director, work with your mentor and try to understand your audience. Know your audience. Um, let's see, I'm on um, letter C. I'm trying to go quickly because I can be quite a talker and I wanna leave plenty of time for you all to ask questions. Um, you can ask me anything from what should I wear to an interview to, uh, you know, uh, how should I ask for a raise to, you know, uh, anything you want about career stuff. We'll get to that at the end. So, uh, but getting back to this, I'm going to go through this really quickly and leave some time for you all to ask questions. Set your intention. What's the feeling you want to uh, to convey? Um, you know, you'll, you'll have that Ralph Lauren idea, or is it gender neutral? Is it by you blues? What, what are you trying to go for? Um, Okay, so in home furnishings, I can speak to that more, more closely than I can in apparel, but normally uh, textiles are designed with a collection in mind. So you will need to think, I think it's important to sort of set your mind's eye on the anchor fabrics, the centerpieces of the collection, the things that are going to really wow the customers, things that are gonna really get their attention. I always think it's a compliment as a designer when the, uh, audience or the buyers get up out of their seats and they want to touch it and they want to look at it more closely. That's a really good sign. So those fabrics I call anchor fabrics. And I, they're also the fabrics that generally tend to be more multicolored. Um, and then from there, you're able to sort of um, kind of decide, okay, well, now that I, I know that I'm going to do this sort of Suzani looking rug design, and it's going to be patinaed and weathered and aged. And I've got all my ideas together from my idea books, then, or my journals, then you can begin to do the coordinates and, the, and then you can go on and do the planes and the solid cloths. Um, and that's, I think, sort of how it works in apparel as well. Once you have those main anchor designs and, and the wow patterns, then you can begin to do the coordinates and then you can begin to do the other um, coordinating elements like the planes. Um, oh yeah, this is great. So give yourself more than one option. Uh, you know, if you're showing your, your, whether you're showing a client or a potential buyer or your creative director, uh, it's usually a good idea to go into those meetings with more than one idea because a lot of times they, they don't just want the first thing that you show them. Um, and also, um, sometimes if you show them some things that maybe aren't necessarily, well, no, 
show them good, better, best. That's how I like to think of it. I show them different options and go into those initial meetings, understanding that it's very likely that they're going to critique and or possibly drop your concepts and you have to go back to the drawing board. If you have options and you have other ideas, then it can often be a jumping off place for more conversations. Well, we like this, but we think that it needs to be smaller uh, or we like this, but we wish it was a little bit you know, less chenille or you know, more novelty yarns. So um, I think it's just really important to have more than one option out there. Um, once your anchor is clear, refer to the ideas, the vision boards, and let those coordinates flow. Yeah, it's funny how once you kind of have a clear understanding of what you want the anchor and the, the anchor fabrics, the feature fabrics to be, then the coordinates, they really flow. They really come out very quickly and easily. And that's really the fun part. Okay, color. Okay. So color is really important. And excuse me. Um, you know, it's funny to me I, in my career, I've noticed a lot of times people say, oh, I'm great with color. And sometimes the people who, who think they're great with color, they're not always great with color. But what I can say is what's very important is go to what's the rate of sales and find out if you can, the top 20 patterns or the top 20 designs or the, or the best selling products that the company you're working for has. And you would be very, it's very informative to take a look at what has sold. Uh, in my industry, in home furnishings, we sell neutrals. <laughs> I can make the most beautiful designs in you know, hot pink and lime green and invariably it's taupe, beige and tan that are gonna sell and gray. And so, but it's very important. Is gray selling more than beige? Is beige selling more than taupe? Uh, how important is cream or white? Uh, if you look at that rate of sales, you'll get a, a good idea about that. Um, but again, you know, find examples, uh, find uh, inspiration. I, I go to fabric stores. I, go, I look to fashion. Uh, my go-tos are Vogue magazine. I love uh, El Decor. I love um, Harper's Bazaar. Again, I'm old school. There's a lot of great stuff out there on Pinterest. So uh, get examples of color. And I think it's also important to, you wanna do what's commercial and is sellable, but also you know, keep in mind your design voice. Your design voice is always going to resonate somehow in the product. So those projects that, that kind of dovetail with what's selling commercially, but also speak to your design voice, those are projects that you should volunteer for and ask for because they're gonna be easier for you and you're likely gonna be more successful. Um, you know, I find it very important to establish a relationship with the sales force. They're out there on the front lines selling. Uh, they are, you know, having direct interface with the customers and they can be really helpful um, with design feedback and color feedback and color can really make or break the sale of a fabric. So really get to know your sales reps and familiarize yourself with them. And hopefully they can give you some good feedback. Um, and also sometimes color, I say this and when in doubt, walk away and come back after you've had some time to think, you know, when you're doing color work, um, sometimes you can get kind of uh, bored or you can get kind of uh, uh, overwhelmed or frustrated. It just doesn't seem to be flowing that day. Um, I would say, you know, that's the time to go get, you know, a cup of coffee, uh, have some chocolate, <laughs> you know, if it's after five, maybe have a glass of wine, I don't know. And you'll be surprised once you get away from it and you come back to it 30 minutes later. Color, I have to be in a, in a quiet space to do color. I can't have like 30 things going on at once. So a lot of times I do color work after five when the phone has stopped ringing and, you know, I'm not with my desk doing emails. Color requires sort of like calmness and you know, slow down and take your time. Um, pattern and construction. The most important thing you can do when you are um, working on any product is to always think, what do I want this to look like in the end? Imagine yourself walking into a retail situation and you are looking at that garment, you are looking at that fabric on the pillow, visualize, visualize, visualize. If this is something that you can't imagine anybody ever buying, stop, you're doing the wrong thing. You have to think, what would 
would the, is this retail bubble? Is this commercial? Will this sell? Is this something that people will embrace? It's very important. Visualize constantly. Um, uh, this is so important. Excuse, excuse me, but how much does this cost? Don't make something that isn't practical. If you are designing things and you are not keenly aware of the price point that you need to be going after, uh, stop. Whatever you do, stop. Because chances are very good you're going to make something that is really too expensive and you know outside of your typical customer's price range always keep in mind uh, you know the price point the best thing that you can do is in terms of price is create something that looks like it costs a lot more than it really does so if something costs you know uh 1095 and it looks like it's 795 a yard you know, you've done a great job. So try to get that inherent perceived value in the in the um, projects that you're working on. Um, yeah, make it new, but but recognizable and familiar. Yeah, so this is always a fine line to walk. You want to make things that are new. The whole point of design is creating. If you're only creating things that have already been done, you're not really doing your job. But if you're creating things that are so avant-garde that they're not practical, then they're not practical and they're not going to be sellable. So you want to keep things, I like to think of it as you want them to be new, but familiar. That's just how I, I tend to look at it. All right, let's move down here to presentation F. Um, so often in your career, whether you're in design or, or some other um, textile uh, a genre, you want to, you're going to have to pr present. You're going to have to show your ideas. You're going to have to show fabric. You're going to have to get up and talk about it at some point. And I've often noticed that sometimes for creative people or people who are just coming out of school, they're a little bit sheepish and shy about making a presentation. And that's totally understandable. I don't think anybody loves to just get up in front of people and <laughs> just start talking. It's very difficult to do. But what I will say is this, focus on what you know. Just look down at what you are talking about and talk about what you know, and you can't go wrong. This is a feature fabric. This is based on uh, uh, um, an old world rug look inspired by the um, rugs from Uzbekistan or wherever it's from. Um, it's vegetable dyed colors. It's a 27 inch repeat, whatever the case may be, just talk about what's in front of you and get out of your own head. Stop thinking about how you look, what you've got on. You know, it's too late at that point. You're in front of them. You've got to get on with the project and the presentation and just talk about what you know. Also, uh, don't apologize. A lot of times, I, you know, I'm sorry, this isn't exactly how I wanted it to be. This isn't exactly what I was hoping it would look like. Don't do that. You know, if it needs to be altered or it needs to be edited or polished in some way, you'll know, you'll know, and, and they'll either tell you that it needs to be, or, you know, uh, it'll just be obvious. Uh, I think sometimes when you over apologize constantly in presentations, it waters you down and suddenly the people who are listening to you are no longer listening to what you're talking about. They're listening to how often you're apologizing for yourself or, um, you know, if you're nervous, they're going to know you're nervous. You don't need to apologize for it. Just keep going. The last thing is be excited and be enthusiastic. It covers a myriad of sins. This morning, I'm super uh, nervous. I am like talking into this little green dot on my screen. I have no idea what I'm doing uh, and that I've, I haven't done a, uh, uh, a, a Zoom meeting presentation like this before, but you know, whatever, I'm here, let's have fun with it, it'll be good. Uh, you guys will help me through it, uh, it'll be fine. It's just one thing in your life, you know, smile, be enthusiastic, have good energy, and you'll, you'll be fine. Um, let's see, final pointers. Um, yeah, in your notebook or on your phone or whatever you, you use to organize yourself, you know, make lists. Um, if you are overwhelmed and you're walking and you're looking at an inbox, an email inbox with like 300 emails 
and you know you've got to do some color work over here and this customer is waiting on a special project, remain calm and just make a list. Make a list and once you see visually all that you have to do, you will begin to prioritize and you will begin to know, okay, what is it I need to attack first? What is it that I need to attack next? And so on and so forth. Um, uh, okay, don't go clutter crazy. Okay, creative people, I think you know what I'm talking about. Um, if you are a designer or a, a creative person, chances are pretty good that your um, workspace, your office, your studio can from time to time get a little bit messy and junky. And I can promise you that when I graduated from uh, college, I was, I had a clutter problem. And um, my um, supervisor sat me down in private and she said to me, Todd, I need to talk to you. Your office is really messy and cluttered up. And um, that's your business. If that's how you want to, you know, remain, if that's how you want to be. But in the community work areas where we're all working together corporately as a group in near the, you know, the computer stations where we were sharing space uh, for the design computer um, uh, in the, in the showroom area, I had papers and pens everywhere. And she said to me, you know, in the community space, it's not fair for you to dominate the area with your clutter. And I was, so embarrassed and I knew immediately that she was so right. And from that moment on, I sort of turned that ship around and I started being much more organized, as organized as I am able to be. I work inside of my limitations by doing things like making lists. Um, I always try once a week to um, like declutter and just take 30 minutes to just get all the clutter organized. Um, sometimes I, uh, at the end of the day, especially on Fridays, I leave the office looking pretty good. It's not perfect, but I know where things are and I'm able to access them. And that's the most important thing. When you have so much clutter that you can't access the things you need when you need to, when your boss comes in and says, I need you to show me that yarn bank and you can't find it because it's buried under a ton of fabrics, it's not good. So you need to man, you need to manage the chaos. For those of you who are super neat and organized, I'm jealous and I can't relate. All right. Um, enjoy your life. Enjoy your job. Okay. Life is for living. Uh, you know, there's something about textiles and there's something about textile design that just pulls you in and you just, it's almost like a drug <laughs> and you become like addicted to it and it becomes, your job becomes like all encompassing. And I can honestly say that in my career, I can think of several time periods where I was really married to my job and I loved my job and I was super immersed in what I was doing. And I think that's natural and I think that's normal, but I also think that it's important to have a life. And I would encourage you to not allow your job to become just like the epicenter of your life. I would encourage you to let it, you know, take, the priority that it should, but you know, as designers, it's very important that you take mental breaks, that you get away from you know the deadlines and the pressure of you know constantly creating new product. You will find that as you um, you know take breaks, take thirty minutes for lunch, take take vacations, make sure that you're having fun on the weekends and doing fun things. It will rejuvenate you and it will it will help you to be fresh on Monday morning and you'll be more eager and you'll be um, I think you'll be happier in the end. OK, so that is my um, crash course uh, in textile design and textiles. I would be happy to field any and all questions that any of you may have for me if you have any. Todd, uh, that was amazing. We have many, many questions, <laughs> as many as we can. Okay. So, so first, a quick hello. Um, Carrie Dillon said, hi, Todd. Hi, Carrie. So, so the first question is, how did you begin to find your, your design voice? And was there any time that your voice changed? Yeah, uh, you know, your design voice does change over time. Uh, it's interesting, but I wouldn't, 
it happens very naturally. It's not something that you cultivate. I would just not worry about that at all. I would just let it happen. Uh, again, be non-resistant, let it flow, uh, and your design voice will change. I think that uh, I realized probably about, mm, I would say a good six, seven years into my career, uh, what my design voice was. I, 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 it, it, it speaks to me through, um, if you wanna find your design voice, I would say go through your closet and look at what you choose to wear. That will tell you a lot about what you gravitate to towards in terms of color. Um, although most designers, we like to wear all black. Um, you can find it in your, um, in your home, in your home decor. Uh, but I think really and truly, uh, if I, the best advice I could give you for that would be to just take some quiet time, get a piece of paper and, and write down what you think your design voice is. What are the things that bring you joy? What colors bring you joy? What textures bring you joy? What things resonate with you? I think you'll find it to be a very rewarding exercise to write those things down on paper. And, uh, and, I, and I think it'll help, help you to refine your voice. Thank you for that. The next three questions all surround the, the topic of mentors. Yeah. So I, I'll ask them all, but then I'm happy to go back and, and reiterate any of them. But you probably have to, because I have a very <laughs> short memory. Okay, go ahead. Who was your mentor and how did you find them or connect to them? Oh gosh, you're going to make me cry. Oh, well, at least it's early in the presentation. Oh. So, you know, it's great to get tears at this moment. <laughs> My mentor was Lee Belmore. She worked and works today for um, Highland House Furniture. We worked together, I was in my late twenties and uh, we didn't hit it off at first. And um, we, she was, uh, uh, she came from a high-end background and I had come from a, a company where we made really inexpensive products. And I think she really kind of questioned my taste level. <laughs> I think she was, uh, she kind of let me know that she was test testing my taste level and I did not agree with her. And I said to her in the very nicest way, um, I don't agree with you. I think I do. I think I can do it. And I want you to, I, I basically made myself vulnerable. And I said, you know, I want you to show me. I want you to help me. I want you to um, help me. Please, will you help me? And it felt awkward for me to say that. And she did. And she really embraced me and she really taught me a lot. And so I guess my uh, advice would be if you find someone that don't, I wouldn't ask the first person that you meet or the first person that you think might be your mentor. It may take you several years to find that mentor. It may not be your very first job. It may be that you're not ready to be mentored. It may mean that you have a little maturing to do. I did. I was not ready for Lee in my first job, but I was ready in my second job. And I knew that I was in a field that I loved. So that's also important. You have to find, you know, once you know what it is that you love to do, that excites you about getting up every day and going to that job, then find someone who is like you, who likes their job and likes doing what they do and ask them to help you. And Maybe in the beginning, it's just that you're asking them for a one or two things, you know, and then they'll come back to you and they'll say, well, how did that go? And, you know, that's a, that's a, that's a, that's a good sign. That's like, they're interested in you and they want to help you and they're following up with you. You know, you, you want them to want to mentor you. So if they're showing interest in you, that's a good sign. If your personalities dovetail, that's a good sign. And don't, worry about forcing it to happen, it will happen, I think, very naturally. Is, is there a way for students to connect with industry mentors while they are still in school? Well, um, I think there are lots of ways you can do that. I think you can, in, uh, putting yourself out there, internships are very important, very, very, very important. Um, I think, um, you know, taught, I think Carrie Dillon 
could be really helpful in in in, 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 in helping people connect like that. Um, I'm. I'm, I'm, I'm a, I'm a mentor. I love being a mentor. Um, I've mentored, uh, you know, several people and um, yeah, I'm not sure if I'm answering your question, but I, I think, you know, there are ways. So those, those individuals that you've mentored, how, how has that relationship occurred? How have you found them or how have they found you? How, how was that selection made? Um, different ways. I have, a, I have as a industry veteran approached the ITA and asked them to, uh, that I would like to be a mentor and I would like to have and host internships. Um, that's, that's how it came about for several uh, people. With me and Katie, um, a, Katie Williams is the creative director for DeLeo and um, she and I had a, a really great relationship for a long time. And that happened because she was an intern for me. Um, and she was super eager. Our personalities really jived. Um, uh, I think internships is probably, you know, the way that most of them have developed. Thank you. The, the next question is about costing. Students typically don't need to think about costing and pricing when creating work. Do you have any advice as to how they can start to understand that on a conceptual level? If they're preparing portfolios for interviews within different tiers of the market, how can they present their work to demonstrate their understanding of different tiers without compromising their concepts and materials? Wow, that is a great question question. I might need a couple of minutes to think about that. I mean, I think that's an extremely great thing. I mean, I think if you can in some way in your portfolio presentation show that you are mindful of cost, <laughs> that's going to be like a great ding, ding, ding. I mean, your employers and, and interviewers are going to love that. That is going to be so great. Um, you know, I think that that is that is that is the essence of design in in a lot of ways is to how do I make something really beautiful but really affordable? I mean, I think, of course, we all are interested in the visual aspect. You know, what is the pattern and what is the color? But there's a lot more that goes into it than that. And if you can show that you're mindful of those things, you know, wow, that's a real feather in your cap. You won't you will want to do that. Um, you know that's, that is the challenge. I mean, how do I make something in my portfolio look great and not sacrifice the quality? You know, craftsmanship is super important. One, one way that you can really impress and dazzle people is with fabulous craftsmanship uh, and make sure that your presentation is gorgeous. That's a great way to do it. Um, but uh, I, I think the most important thing is just to mention you know, and talk about the importance of cost and value and components and how you're mindful of that. I think that in your portfolio, I, I suppose there would be someone who would contradict me and say that this is not true, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take a chance and say that in my opinion, make your portfolio as gorgeous as you can and do not, that's not the time to worry about making it look, you know, like you made a purse out of a sow's ear, like make your portfolio and the things in the content of your portfolio as beautiful as you possibly can. But do mention when you're talking about your uh, items in your portfolio, how you, know, you were thinking about cost and you're thinking about materials. I think that would be the most important thing. That leads into the next few questions about portfolios specifically. Mm -hmm. um, from Sophia Turco, one of our brilliant seniors, uh, hello, thank you for speaking today. This is great. Do you have any advice on digital portfolios or websites? Yeah, I think that a lot of people who are going to possibly be interviewing you will be people from, I'm 50 years old. I would say that a lot of the people that are going to be interviewing you are not going to be as uh, savvy, tech savvy, uh, and I think they're going to love it. <laughs> I mean, I think they're going to just love it. Anything that you can do digitally. I mean, if you, the only thing I will say though, is this, there is something, you know, it's kind of like shopping when you, um, 
go and you buy everything online, there's, there's something about the shopping in person experience that's sort of fun. You know, you want to touch the fabric and feel the garment or see the product or touch it somehow. What I would suggest is that you do a blended approach where you have a few of your most beautiful prized things, excuse me, and your portfolio. And then I would have a modicum of digitally presented product. I think that blended approach will show them that you have a certain aperture or, or acumen with tech related and digital presentation, which I think would be great. But I also think having a few things that are tangible and real would be really great as well because it gives, and it also is, um, I notice in design presentations and interviews sometimes when there's nothing, when it's all digital, textiles says it's a tactile thing. You know, you kind of want to like touch something or feel something or, or see how it was made. So I think a blended approach and do a little bit of both would be, would be the best approach. Thank you. Uh, in, in a portfolio, do you want to see a wide range of aesthetics or a more unified voice? I think a more unified voice makes the most sense, is the most practical thing. I think that it, it, it'll, you know, but you don't want to strike the same note over and over. In other words, you don't want to just show, show stripes, 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 stripes. That's not practical. You want to show them that you have a breadth of understanding visually, but anytime you can show things that are, maybe all of your boards are the exact same size. Maybe they're all presented in a way that's really clever and cohesive. I think a cohesive portfolio is beautiful. I love a cohesive portfolio. I always, this is a little bit off the subject, but I always mount everything on black that way when everything is mounted on black and everything's the same size, it, it brings a certain degree of cohesion. Um, am I answering the question? You, you are answering the question. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. I so think that is... you want, I think you want to make your voice really clear. So if they hire you, they know this is their style. This is what they're good at. This is where I can see them working. I can see them, you know, that way when they, when you go to work for them, your skill set, you know, jives with 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 what they with what they need. I I think that's brilliant advice. Thank you. So staying in this line of advice, mm -hmm. what is your advice for asking for a raise? And is the advice the same if you're a new designer or a senior level designer? No, it is not the same. <laughs> this is a tricky topic, but a very important one. Um, I would say that when you are new, I would, you have to, I would encourage you all to think of the first two years after college as an, extenu as an extenuation of your education. I would not think of your first two years as I'm going to be Anna Wintour, you know, and I'm going to, you know, just set the world on fire with my design brilliance, you know. You have to think of those first couple of years as I'm learning what it is to be, you know, in a job uh, eight to five, uh, I'm watching, I'm seeing how people interact. I'm learning how to overcome office drama and stay out of the fray. I'm learning how to, you know, um, uh, be prepared and polished in all meetings and all ways. And so while you're still in that learning mode and you're still taking in, just be grateful that you have a job because mm -hmm. it's so important to have a little experience when you are interviewing for that second or third job it's vitally important that you have that experience on your resume. And that first job is very important. I wouldn't worry about money, really, honestly. My first job out of college, I made peanuts. I mean, peanuts. But it was a job. It gave me experience. It taught me what it is I wanted to do, which is home furnishings. It got my foot in the door. I got to meet people. That helped me to network. Uh, networking is very important. You want to, you know, meet people and, 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 you know, who knows, maybe they can help you someday, you know, tell you about a job lead that they might have. Okay, getting to the second part, when you're a senior designer, and you are, you feel like it's time for a raise. Um, 
you need to take a lot of consider a lot of things into consideration. How many of how how many hours a week are you working? Is your product really selling? Is your product really making a difference? You need leverage. And what I mean by leverage is, is, you know, you can't just ask for money because you're, you're a warm body, you know, <laughs> you need some kind of leverage. You need some kind of, of reason to give them to, you know, say, I have been working here for five years and um, I have loved it. And it has been, you know, you want to say as many positive things as possible. I've loved it. I especially liked working on that project with Crate and Barrel, and I especially liked that project with West Elm, and I've really created a lot of meaningful relationships with this person and that person, and I would like to know, you know, can you help me or tell me what it is I need to do to go to the next level? And I don't think you'd need to say the words, I want to raise. I think that's a little too abrupt. And when you kind of let your bosses know that you've been like a team player and you've been contributing and you've been doing what you need to do, um, then I think that you have an opportunity to have a private one-on-one -on -one conversation. And when you warm them up with the idea of, I want to talk, I want, I want to know what I need to do to go to the next level, then you're giving that person a chance to say, well, I tell you what, that's a very interesting point that you're bringing up let's get together sometime in the next quarter and let's talk about that. And the next quarter, you know, meaning in the next 12 weeks. And, um, and that gives them a chance to, you're not putting them on the spot. You're not confronting them. You're not like making them feel awkward. And you're letting them know, I have a certain degree of ambition. I have goals. This is something I wanna do. This is something I wanna talk about eventually. I'm not breathing down your neck, but you know, this is something I think is worthwhile. We can talk about. And if it's very clear, and you'll know from their body language and their voice, if they are not feeling it. <laughs> and, you know, that may mean you need to drop back and punt and you're going to have to make some decisions. Are you going to be okay if you don't get a raise or, you know, and also give them time, you know, in 12 weeks, if they don't come back to you and they don't say anything, then you can say, you know, we, I think we were going to talk about this in last quarter, but, it, you know, we both got busy and it didn't happen. Um, I, I really would like to get around to that conversation though and put it out there. Um, and then the other thing I would say is I don't like to uh, name a, especially like later in your career, I don't like to put a number out there. I always like to say things like, well, I'm sure if an offer was made, it would be a fair one and put the onus back on them and not always, you know, give away what you, you know, let them, let them tell you what they're, what they're willing to pay you if you can. And if that doesn't work, call me. <laughs> I'm thinking, okay, so now Todd's phone number is. <laughs> I put my Instagram handle at the top, you know, just yeah. DM me. Yeah. Uh, do you see that design roles have merged more with sales with the current landscape of social media? How do you see designers becoming more influential in the overall sales and marketing approach? That seems, that's a great question as well. Can you read it to me again? Sure. Do you see that design roles have merged more with sales with the current yeah. landscape of social media? Yes. And then how do you see designers becoming more influential in the overall sales and marketing approach? Well, for sure, for sure. I mean, I can say for me as a designer, I try to have a strong um, social media presence. I'm constantly, you know, letting people know what, what I'm working on, what I'm feeling, what I'm channeling, uh, what's, what's working with, for me, um, design inspiration, things I'm kind of interested in. I think it's extremely important. You know, you are your own brand. You really are. Whether you are an independent designer or you work for a company, you need to act, you need to clarify your design voice. And, you know, if you work inside of a company, you can't go around, you know, like, look at me, I'm a brand or, you know, you're going to look crazy, but you want your work to be cohesive and be, you know, the best that it can be. And over time, you know, it will begin to create its own voice and its own presence and its own brand. Um, but, you know, uh, yeah, I think it's, I, I, I am in design and sales. I, as I, I sell as well as design. And 
that's, you know, one I was alluding to earlier in your presentation skills, you know, be bold, be enthusiastic, be friendly, be positive, and talk about what you know, and don't talk about what you do not know. <laughs> it would be much better for you to say, I'm not sure about that. Let me get back to you on that than to say something that's, you know, sounds made up or contrived. Uh, but yeah, absolutely. I absolutely believe that, you know, uh, social media, branding, marketing, you know, all those are things that, you know, um, designers and sales, it's, it's definitely converging. We have a few more questions and a few minutes, so we'll try to get to them all. Um, okay. My apologies to our guests if we don't get to your question. Uh -huh. so how do you see the interiors industry changing post COVID-19? You know, it's interesting. Um, I've talked to a lot of my friends and, 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 and my competitors. Uh, we are experiencing a, a certain degree of stability that I had not, ex that I had not expected. I think, I really do believe that a lot of people have nested and cocooned during COVID. And I think that they've watched a lot of television and binge watched. And I think they've looked around and said, well, you know what, we're not gonna go on vacation this, this year. We're not gonna get on a plane. We're not gonna go to Disney World. We're not gonna go to Europe. We're not gonna go even to Canada. You know, let's spend some money on the home interiors. Let's, let's make our houses, you know, I have, I've done that this, this year. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think it's, I think going forward, um, I think, I think that furniture and interiors are going to be bought more and more online. We have seen that, um, that's definitely the trend. I don't know. I'm old school. It's hard for me to imagine buying a sofa without actually seeing it. That's a big piece of real estate to put in my living room. It will be interesting to me. I think that the uh, there will be more of an emphasis on, um, I'm not sure what it's called anymore. What is it when, when uh, it's like Modicad, when fabrics are superimposed on furniture silhouettes and you can kind of get a feel for what they're going to look like. I think a lot of that kind of interactive thing is going to become more and more important. Um, it will be really interesting to see how. I'm not quite sure uh, how it will in, how it will change, but I think COVID will definitely um, have. I think a lot of people have purchased online now for their homes. It will be really interesting in the next 18 months to see if that trend continues, or if people say, you know what, uh, I bought some things online and they did not turn out how I hoped they would. So. We'll see. Uh, it'll be interesting. Well, thank you. And I think, Todd, we're going to make that the last question. Thank you so much for your presentation today. Well, thank you, Marcia. It was fantastic. Uh, it's prompted a lot of discussion. And, and I can share with you that my colleagues and I have been texting each other. This is an amazing point. Our students need to take this in. So thank you. That was really brilliant. We appreciate it. My so. pleasure. Thank you so much. Thank you.